Well, a warm welcome to this talk, and I'm delighted to welcome Josh uh, Getzko. And uh, in the north of England, it's getting quite cold now, but it looks a bit warmer where you are, Josh, is it? Yeah, it is. I'm in Tel Aviv. It's, it's 30 degrees today. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't mind some of that cold weather. Can you, can you send it down this way? And I wouldn't mind some of your warm weather. <laughs> so you, you're an academic, Josh, at a Hebrew University, but basically you've got links with, with the States as well, though. And... Um, You've been studying some pretty interesting things. And the first one we wanted to talk about is the um, the different processes that were used in the production of the Pfizer vaccine. Now, there seems to be process one and process two, and this has got particular processes were used in the trials. Just give us a bit of background on that, Josh, if you don't mind, please. OK, yeah, sure. So the key point here is that in the clinical trial that Pfizer BioNTech ran on their COVID vaccine, they used uh, vaccine doses that were made with one manufacturing process, what you refer to as process one. But what was given to the public after the trial uh, was not the same type of doses. They, instead, they used a different manufacturing process, an upscale manufacturing process they call process two, and that was what everybody received when they got vaccinated. And now, now the question is, well, what's the difference between these two processes? Does it matter? And, and, and it probably does matter a lot. And, we, and I can walk you through some of the evidence of, of why we think it matters. But just to give you sort of the general background, and I don't know all of the technical details of this. I, I know enough to kind of understand it, but we all have... Uh, uh, learned about peace. So what do you need to do to make an, R an mRNA vaccine? You need to create, you need to generate mRNA. How do you do that? Well, mRNA is like a copy of a part, part of a strand of DNA. So you need DNA as sort of your backbone template that you can then create mRNA off of that DNA. Okay. So where do you get that DNA from? Well, you can, w with the process one, they were basically using a PCR process to duplicate DNA, right? That's what they do with, with PCR. They want to check, do you have any of, any, any of this uh, tr uh, remnant of DNA in your nose that we can say was, you know, COVID, was SARS-CoV-2 or whatever, right? So they replicate it, right? That's the whole idea behind the PCR. And it's relatively clean, to do it that way. And they were also using a very, very high quality uh, uh, system using these um, magnetic, these sort of magnetic beads to take out any impurities after that PCR process was used. Again, to create the template where then they, you know, they, they use that to generate the, MR, the, the mRNA. In process two, they use a different method to generate the, MR, the DNA backbone Okay, where they basically have a DNA template that they've put into this thing called a plasmid, um, which is part of a bacteria. Okay, and so when the bacteria, well, the plasmids can um, duplicate and then the bacteria also duplicates. And it turns out to be a far more cost effective, scalable way. You know, you can just have, instead of like a, ha having to put it in a PCR machine, you just have these big vats of, I don't know actually how big they are, but you know, you have these vats of, of bacteria growing and they can replicate very, very quickly. And then the, you, you basically, you take the plasmids and you, you take their DNA and you, you make it, they make it linear instead of like wrapped up. And then they use that to, to generate the, the mRNA. But after that point, what they need to do is they have the plasmid DNA and they have the bacteria still in that goo and they need to clean that out and purify it and that's where they've seemed to have done a terrible job and i don't know if you've been following any of the revelations that are coming out where more and more researchers around the world are replicating this finding that there are high levels of this um, plasmid dna remnants in um, the vials of the Pfizer vaccine that have been tested. In addition to that, we know from Pfizer's own documents that they've submitted to various regulatory agencies that there's, uh, there's some residual po uh, lipopolysaccharide, the, otherwise known as endotoxin. This is the membrane 
so what is the bacteria that they use for you know duplicating this? It's E. coli bacteria, and um, which is a type of bacteria that's known as gram-negative bacteria. And the membranes of gram-negative bacteria are highly inflammatory. <laughs> They're called endotoxin for a reason, right? They're called, um, and so there are higher levels um, of this endotoxin in the process to um, vials. And again, this is based on what we know from Pfizer's own filings um, to the regulator. Can I just see if I've got this right so far, uh, Josh, if I just run this past you? So the process one, they synthesize the DNA. I assume synthesize it in the right bases in the right order. And then they multiply the amount of DNA with, with a PCR process. Now, I'm not a forensic specialist, but I, th I think we probably do this in, in forensics, where there's a tiny amount of DNA found at a crime scene, for example, or, or in an archaeological specimen, which is a fascinating field. And they're able to multiply up the amount of DNA to, so they've got enough to sort of be able to recognize it. So they use this duplication process and that PCR process, it's the same as is used in testing where you duplicate the amount of RNA that's present. And of course, there's a debate about that and how much it should be duplicated and whether that can give rise to false positive results, of course. But, but leaving that aside, so the, the, here the, the increased amount of DNA, they use that DNA to make the RNA. So the DNA is the code to make the RNA. So it's DNA makes RNA makes protein is the, is the, is the way it goes in biology. And that's trial process one. But trial process two sounds a bit more like making beer to me. <laughs> um, you, uh, you push it, put it all in some big vat. Instead of using yeast, though, you use bacterium, uh, E. coli bacteria, we believe. We know a lot about their manufacturing method, and a lot of it came through the EMA data breach. Uh, yeah. but there's other, yeah, yeah. There's other writings about it. There's publications. We, we know. Mm -hmm. that's good so the, the, the process too you kind of make a batch now a plasmid is basically a way for transferring genetic material from one bacterium to another as far as i understand it i think that's right yeah yeah so, so they're using this kind of way the, the dna is in the plasmid and uh that means you've got bacterial components there as well and we don't want uh dna from the plasmid and we don't want other things for, like 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 bits of cell membrane left over right um i would imagine if, if you gave if you did have cell membrane in any injection we're not saying the cell membrane in this but if you did have gram negative cell, cell membrane in an injection that would make you feel pretty rough for a period of time it could and, and it's and a toxic we'll talk about that later how that might be linked to some of the some of the yeah. uh, adverse events that came up and have been um you know uh written up in the mainstream academic press that we didn't see hardly at all in the trials. So we can talk about that later if you want. Mm -hmm, indeed. Now, have I got that summary roughly right, Josh? Is that, that sum summary exactly right? And okay. before we get past this, I want to make this point very clear is that yeah. when, you're, when you're making a biological uh, medical product or biologic, the process is crucial. In fact, some, would, some people say, the, the process is the product because you're dealing with these very complex, you know, biochemical interactions, um, large molecules. I'll give you an example. Have you ever heard of the Cutter incident? No, please tell me. The Cutter incident, and this, there was a book written by one of the, you know, high priests of vaccinology in the U.S., Paul Offit, on this topic. But what happened, the Cutter incident happened with the original polio vaccines in the 1950s. So Jonas Salk, you know, created this polio vaccine. They ran a, a trial on about 2 million children. It was very successful. And so then they turned it over to a few different labs and they said, okay, now we need to, to make a bunch of this stuff. But they didn't provide them with the precise directions on how to exactly replicate Salk's process. And so what happened the, in the Cutter laboratory, they were making vaccines that had live polio virus. And when they injected them into kids, they got polio. There were over 200,000 kids who got a short-lived polio, uh, a few hundred who got permanent polio, and a few, a few kids who actually died. 
Okay? This is not conspiracy theory. This is not anti-vax mythology. You know, this is, this is accepted history. And one of the key lessons that was learned uh, from that is, yeah, when you're dealing with something complicated like a vaccine, a biological drug, you need to be very precise about the method. And once you change the method, you change the product. And you can't just assume that it's going to have the same effect uh, on people. So you need to do another uh, clinical trial on your new product. It's not the same product.